Welcome to Season 2 of Purdue University College of Science's Superheroes of Science podcast. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We will be discussing anything and everything related to science. If you have a science question, tweet it to us at Purdue SOS, and we will try and find someone to answer it for you. Welcome to this edition of Superheroes of Science. We're here today with Professor Robert Nowak from the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. He's one of our seismologists here in the department at Purdue University. Welcome Hi. for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, we appreciate it. There's uh, so many cool projects that you're working on, and mm -hmm. we want to share those with the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know I, when I get to talk to you in the hallway and stuff, I get very excited about your stuff you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're down the hall. Your so office cool. is adjacent near me. Yeah, so. I, right. Right. <laughs> so I get to see you, but the rest of the world doesn't, mm -hmm. so they don't mm -hmm. get to. And mm -hmm. so our goal today, I think, is just to let them know some of the current projects you're doing and some of the mm -hmm. science behind those projects. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, well, let's start with, um, what do we say, seismologist? Right. Is that mm -hmm. what you consider yourself, a seismologist? Uh, well, there's kind of various designations. There's geoscientists, mm -hmm. you know, which is the broader term, and it includes various fields of atmospheric science and geology and, and geophysics. And seismology is a part of solid earth geophysics, okay. which studies basically the interior of the earth. Uh, and uh, as a seismologist, we study uh, uh, how seismic waves go through the Earth. And uh, I don't know if you've got some, some backup sides here, but there are two main types of seismic waves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are P waves and S waves, and P waves are somewhat like sound waves. In fact, they're sound waves in the ground, and they sort of vibrate the air back and forth of the ground uh, as they propagate. Uh, but solids have uh, another type of wave called shear waves, and they vibrate back and forth, and at, in the, perpendicular to the way the, the waves are going, and those are particularly damaging to buildings and structures. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, but it is kind of interesting to think, you could think again of P waves as sound waves in the ground, and the major distinguishing uh, feature is their pitch. And I think we had this, of if we talked about uh, sound waves in air, I think we had a little example here mm -hmm. of a, a tonal generator. You want to yeah. just play I'm with that, that for a second? Yeah. Uh, and, and this one is yeah, it's sorry. just to kind of uh, reacquaint people with... Um, here, take that seat so okay. we can stand in front of you. Yep. Oh, okay, so you might have to play around if I'm doing that. So, so we go to the, the, uh, the tone generator one. There we go. So this is one, just an example of online to just kind of remind people of what's the distinguishing features of different kinds of sound waves. And it's the pitch. And the pitch can be quantified uh, as the frequency in hertz, which is cycles per second. And so here we have Steve putting on a particular one, 653 hertz, but your piano keyboard would have particular uh, tunings of certain frequencies in octaves. And so you could have middle C, you could go to a different frequency. Here well, we're just doing this. Earlier you mentioned middle C would be about what? Uh, 440 maybe. I have to get this right for you it, music people here. You know it precisely. <laughs> we won't hold you to it. Yeah. So, but if you go higher than that, let's say you go 800 hertz, for example. You hear that it's it's a it's basically a, a higher pitch. Now now we're talking here, and as a consequence, we've got all kinds of pitches in mm -hmm. the sound that we're 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 generating by talking music as well. So you could have like an orchestra or something, uh, and so Steve now is sort of going up in frequency. And uh, as we do this, let's we should let's hold here for a second. Maybe just do it. So so humans can hear roughly up to about ten. Or of hertz if your ears are good for the students in your classroom yeah, maybe 10 or 12 10 or 12 thousand hertz okay thousand and, and thousand so if you put hertz. thousand hertz so if you put five thousand here all right then uh, and you play that most people can hear this so that's but if you, go, if you go it's kind of piercing and we shouldn't pay too much so if you go to <laughs> eight thousand hertz and you may have to turn the volume down here for people it's going to be higher pitch than this and many oh. of you, and, oh. and much past about 10,000, people sort of lose their hearing. And for me, it's about 10,000. For the kids in your classroom, probably uh, up to 12,000. Yeah, I hear nothing on I, this. I hear yes. 10,000. Yeah, I don't. And so, again, okay. my Sarah, ears have long loud, since. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Sarah being the kid so, of the group here, she's right. hearing it. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, so, now, again, music and, uh, and, uh, 
you know, sound waves is different pitches that you hear. But you can, but basically for earthquake waves, from seismic waves, from earthquakes, for example, they're much lower frequency. Okay. And yet they do cover a wide range of pitches or frequencies. And those are quite critical because it depends on what damage an earthquake, uh, uh, the waves from a large earthquake would uh, 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 generate in terms of damage. Uh, middle school level, uh, right. science, S wave, P wave, they're right. in our curriculum. So we're starting right. teaching that in middle school. Right. But in, it, I know there are waves, and when I teach it, I right. tell kids, oh, well, a wave is like a transfer of energy. So it's energy right. that's moving through. Right. But I have never thought, I don't know why I didn't make the connection, I never right. thought about, well, it's just a sound, like a sound wave going through. Right. But right. it's low enough that maybe I'm not hearing it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so I, I'd never thought about it that way. Right, right. Until I, I talked to you in the hallway, I'm like, oh. Yeah. I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, typically, it depend, earthquakes uh, tend to generate seismic waves around one hertz. And so you and I would not be able oh. to hear that. Mm -hmm. In fact, if your ears are good, you can hear down to maybe 50 hertz, 50 to 100. Oh, okay. and, and in fact, the, the range from 10 to 100 hertz is the type of frequencies used by industry to look for oil. And because oh. uh, they send these waves, they have to be a certain frequency that they can reflect off of the layers in the subsurface. Uh, so, so why does it have to be that frequency? Uh, the frequency also relates to sort of what the wavelength in the air, the solid is. And if you want to pick up those uh, fine layering, you have to have a bit higher frequency. And that's why it would go up to about 100 hertz or so. Oh, okay. you know? But then after that, you know, the, the higher frequencies in the ground get damped out. So, so it's just sort of a different range. Now you can go really low frequencies, and those are under one hertz, like a, a tenth of a hertz. So remember, one hertz is one cycle per second. Mm -hmm. So you take your, your, your legs and go down one one thousand up, that's one hertz. If you take spend 10 seconds and go up and down and do that, that would be a tenth of a hertz or 0.1 hertz. Now that's relevant to buildings because very roughly uh, uh, buildings have certain characteristic frequencies, and it's roughly 0.1 second per floor. And so, so uh, a one-story building would roughly have a uh, 0.1 second or 10 hertz resonance. A 10-story building, like our math building here at Purdue, mm -hmm. would be uh, 0.1 second per floor would be uh, 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 one second or one hertz. And, and the Willis Tower in it's Chicago at 100 hertz would resonate at roughly 0.1 hertz or a tenth of a hertz. which they resonate, now at that point, you're talking about the resonant frequency of, of the building, building itself. So, so, so if the seismic wave hits that frequency of that building resonant, the, the building will, will vibrate. Will and actually rate. vibrate. Right, and, and that's bad because the, the engineer would like to, to, to impede that happening, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want the building to get damaged, and so it's kind of like the wine glass, that if you yeah, hit it with yeah. a certain frequency, mm -hmm. it will shatter. And, and buildings are like that as well. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so, so roughly in, in sort of the geohazard point of view of damage due to big earthquakes, 0.1 hertz to 10 hertz is kind of the range. If I'm interested in looking for energy resources and things like that, it's 1 to 100 hertz. So it's just a different oh. range. But I think we have an example here that now we were just doing pure tones here. Yes. Of course, mm -hmm. everyone would know that speak, spoken you know, sound waves and, and music are very complex and, and uh, they have just a very wide range of an entire orchestra of sounds, right? Mm -hmm. And what I have, basically earthquakes are the same. They will generate a wide range, a whole orchestra of sounds are coming. And that's and, like uh, going through the ground, right? It is, it's going through the ground. And again, it's quite critical from the point of view of damage due to these earthquake waves. Okay. And, and, uh, but I think we have some examples yeah. of essentially playing back uh, 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 an earthquake wave, uh, 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 a seismic wave in the audio range. So we basically take the thing and speed it up 10 times. And I think we have one from the, the magnitude uh, Which uh, one nine. Like? That one, the, should you do that this one, one first? That, that's the, before, before you start it, let me yeah. just comment here. The thing above, if you see that picture, is what's called the seismogram. That's okay. the recording on a seismogram. And that's right here. Yeah, of, of, of the vibrations uh, uh, so uh, uh, right of, of a pen or just actually the vibrations of the ground. And, and those, again, you wouldn't hear those, but again, the buildings would hear them. And if you play those back uh, 
faster, you can actually hear it, hear the earthquake in in audio. Okay. And so let's try this here for the play, great, and it shows nine. where we are, right? Right. Whoa. So we're hearing an earthquake. That's right. Right. But it's Play, not played back at, 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 at ten times the speed. Okay, but this is not. This isn't the sound wave okay. that generated. Yeah. Here. Now this, this one says here. Room. This is actually a hundred times. It says on this. Hundred one. times. 100. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That would probably be better. Okay. And this earthquake, if you remember, this is in 2011. This was the the Fukushima earthquake, the one that damaged the nuclear power plant. Okay. Oh now, now the nuclear power plant withstood this vibration reasonably well, but then what happened was there was also a tsunami that, you know, breached the the oh. the, 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 the seawall, and it basically flooded out the the secondary generator. So, so the gener the, the electricity was knocked out by the earthquake. And then the, the, the tsunami or the tidal wave came, breached the seawall, and basically flooded the secondary generators. It just so everybody no knows when we say tsunami, right? That that's is a size tidal wave that's it caused by an earthquake. Okay, that's right. Okay. So that would be different than a storm surge due to a hurricane, for example. They're quite okay. different. So, but in order to get a tsunami, you have to have an earthquake kind of under the seafloor that ruptures the sea floor mm -hmm. and if it does it can get kind of like a, a bathtub wave if you want in in the water column and and those can be uh, actually in deep water they're not necessarily that high uh, at, you know several meters or so but when you go into harbors they can get huge oh. and, and that's kind of you know where the the problem lies and again these nuclear power plants at Fukushima were white they needed you know cooling water and things like that were right on the coast. But they had a seawall and they thought it was high enough. But they didn't realize that they could get a magnitude 9 earthquake at that location uh, in Japan. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they, they, this was north of Tokyo and then south is where they thought bigger earthquakes would occur. And we, when we say like <laughs> magnitude 9 earthquake, uh, I'm, I'm an Indiana boy, Midwest here. And so it's <laughs> not a lot of earthquakes in my lifetime. I mean, right. There's like been a couple that shook the the pictures on the on the wall, right? It, right, I mean, right. That's as serious as it ever got. It, it was mm -hmm. not much. And so, what? Uh, when you say nine, I mean, is that a huge number? Is that is this a? I mean, su super scary. I assume then. Uh, I mean, what would be one that we would like make me barely feel? Well, it depends on the area. So in California, they have lots of earthquakes, mm -hmm. but they also have a lot of mountains and things like that. So the vibration waves going out from a fault breaking and then, you know, resulting in these vibrations, uh, uh, don't travel as fast as they, uh, as far out as they do here in the Midwest. Oh, so a relatively right. smaller magnitude earthquake that might occur in the Midwest, and we have less of them here, mm -hmm. but will often be felt over a long, larger distance. So a few years ago, there was a, a four down in Evansville, yeah. Yeah. and it was felt really throughout the state. But in in uh, California, they just don't. The vibrations get broken up by the topography. Okay, and is right. part of that the substrate is going to be like the sand? Yeah. Does the sand deaden it versus where we're have more bedrock? Uh, or is that well, it's just it? a more. It's the geology. Of okay, the area. this is a more layered geology, and the waves just can propagate further out. Hmm. But but roughly speaking, the the magnitude scale was was uh, kind of you know developed by a guy named Richter in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had to sort of contend with the fact that the vibrations of seismic waves can be highly variable. And to very perceptible, now this isn't pitch now, this is the other parameter we're talking about, is how much is the ground moving. The and intensity. this would be more like the loudness okay. of the sound. Oh, right? okay. So it's loudness versus pitch. You know, and the two things that if one does music, what one so would we're all know. Have yeah. to take a music yeah, class. Yeah, so, so, so you have to take a music class. Yeah. But, but, but vibrations in the earth are so highly variable that Richter basically came up with a kind of a powers of 10 scale. So if the vibrations, and they had to develop sensor, seismic sensors. So a seismograph is a device that measures the vibrations of the ground. People can certainly feel 
earthquakes mm -hmm. and vibrations, but you kind of had to quantify it. And so uh, Richter, working in Southern California, had a certain type of seismograph that they had put out in Los Angeles and area. And, and they wanted to quantify how big the earthquakes were based on how they were felt a certain distance away. And he had to correct for the geology and things like that because he wanted to know something oh. about how big the fault was or how, how, much, how, how big the source was of the vibration. Mm -hmm. And so his scale was a powers of 10 scale, meaning that if uh, the magnitude, if, if the, the sensor amplitude, the, the, mm -hmm. the loudness, mm -hmm was, and it would be kind of like the pen motion on the seismograph, seismo seismogram on this picture. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 if that was 10 times bigger, then he would ascribe the earthquake a magnitude one higher. Okay, so, so like if it's 100 that, times more than the base reference, and he had to have a reference earthquake as mm -hmm. well, that he would calibrate, and he called the reference earthquake a zero. And, and that was kind of the smallest perceptible one he could get in Southern okay. California. So one would be 10 times bigger. But, you know, human perception isn't very quantitative in this sense. Mm -hmm. So that's why you needed a calibrated seismograph to, to do this, right? So, so then, you know, a four would be pretty substantive in a moderate earthquake, you know, in California as well. A five would have 10 times the ground motion as a four, as, a four. as measured okay. on a calibrated Because uh, in my mind, I think, uh, oh, a five years going or a four years going up to five, that's a little bit more, but it's actually 10 times more than right. that. Right, mm -hmm. and so a six would be 100 times more than a four. Than the four. Right, okay. now, now it gets a little tricky here, and I like to just keep it as the factor of 10. Yeah, because, because the logarithmic because, scale. Well, no, 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 it's just easy. it's better to do the factor of 10 in what the seismograph sees, and that's okay. quite how it was defined. Energy is a little bit different because it's a factor of 30 in energy, and it's just how much oh. energy the seismic waves punch. But but Richter basically did it as literally what does the seismograph measure? Okay, and it's okay. easier for for me to think about rather than than that. Hmm. So you'll kind of see it in two different ways if you look online well, for like, basically like USGS. a lot more energy going You're out right, there, and right. it's a lot bigger. And it's so, and so one step's not a simple thing. Right, They're right. Small thing. And, and so when you get to magnitude nines, these are really there's a huge fault that generated those waves. Okay. And so uh, prior to the Fukushima earthquake, there was the one people may remember the 2004 one in Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, yes. and that was also, I believe. Uh, very big in that sense, but the largest earthquake in the 20th century was the 1960 Chile earthquake. And if people have a, a map of, of South America and you've got this flat coastline of Chile, mm -hmm. the, the magnitude 9 of the 1960, the largest of the 20th century, essentially broke a fault one-third the length of Chile. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. down about 500 kilometers into the ground in a massive subduction zone earthquake. And oh, wow. again, it was so large, it actually could be sensed in the slight changes of the vibration of the earth. Oh, wow. It was that of big. The whole, oh. and, these, and these are called free oscillations for these very, very big vibrations in the earth. And, uh, um, and, so, and, and the free oscillations are really like the bell vibrations of mm -hmm. the whole earth. Mm -hmm. And these truly massive ones, like a nine, can, can essentially generate those. Oh, and, that, wow. and, and, and the earth vibrated for 10 years at these really low frequencies from the 1960 earthquake. For so, 10 years? Yeah. So when you say that it can, that a, a magnitude nine, like that large of an earthquake can affect the free oscillations of the earth. Yeah. Because the bell, the bell modes of the earth, yeah. That and that, and that's what that. Yeah, that's it's, it's pretty amazing. Mode. And a nine is is you'd have to. Uh, I think those are about as big as they get, basically. So uh, and again, this is kind of pointing out that that for these really large vibrations in the earth, they're often uh, fractures and faults, like the San Andreas mm -hmm. Fault or something like that. 
and and uh, and in 1906 there was, and I think we might have a picture of this in my notes of the damage due to an earthquake. Oh, let's go back. If you go down a little bit here, uh, we're yeah, talking I think about that's some of the slides we didn't put in. Oh, you decided didn't. not to put those in. Well, that's when fine. I I cut and pasted really fast, and I thought, oh, oh we we'll talk to, about we the. To, no, we don't have to put those in. But I was. I didn't think say about that, us talking that, about the, that. Uh, 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 my bad. Uh, and sometimes people like that. They mm -hmm. like kind of. Mm -hmm. and hazards and yeah. things like that. That's kind of not, I, I, I have that for a different talk in here, but uh, but uh, uh, but vibrations can be used for lots of things. But but I should suffice to say no, that in 2010, uh, 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 the earthquake in, in Haiti uh, uh, essentially had an extensive amount of damage. And it wasn't particularly that big. It just happened right under uh, the country of Haiti, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so there's lots of damage as well. Similar to this, the 6.4 in Puerto Rico uh, mm -hmm. that happened uh, on January 7th. It, that's what and, we're seeing uh, here, right? We've pulled uh, up what you can measure in Lafayette. Oh yeah, if you go yeah. if you go back here, I think this is yeah, this is the Puerto Rico earthquake, yeah. and this is this January this 7th. This is a seismogram, and this is kind of tricky to know how it's looked. It's kind of continuous motion. And and each vertical horizontal line is one hour. Okay. And the deviations back and forth are the are the vibrations measured on a seismograph uh, uh, a few miles west of West Lafayette, Indiana. And so 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 something and, from Puerto Rico we can actually measure right here, here. right all the way over here. And and again, this is a six point four. We were just previously talking about a magnitude nine in the Fukushima earthquake that would easily wow. be felt all over the world. Now, wow. Wow. now at these measurements between seven and eight, I see a small. That's a train. That's, that's a train. That's a train, yeah, train you're measuring. Train motion. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow! So 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 we're also interested in local sources, and we have have regular trains that go through Lafayette. And that one just happens to go just south of the Wabash River, and uh, it's near. It's kind of within a few miles of that station. Wow. So, so relatively speaking, that that train certainly doesn't have as much power as that earthquake did. Uh -huh. But the earthquake is thousands of miles away. So, and it is amazing in that sense that uh, if you have a really big earthquake, it can push the ground so hard. That again, it can be measured on a seismograph, but it's actually, if it kind of for for intuition, you know, on things, you know, for a magnitude seven or eight earthquake, it can actually move the ground here by the width of the lead of your pencil. So if you think of that, that's Whoa. like a millimeter. So if you think of a millimeter, like the width of a tooth of a postage yeah. stamp, mm -hmm. but it's going so slowly in pitch that your pre your your perceptional aspect may not pick it up unless you're kind of lying in bed and you're really calm in bed. If you're driving a car, you wouldn't, yeah. even for a local mm -hmm. earthquake, you wouldn't necessarily feel those if you're driving around in a car. Okay. But if you're very calm and quiet and, and kind of, a, a, you know, you're eating your breakfast in the morning, you may actually feel those. But these very distant ones, and again, they have to be big ones if they're far away for the waves to go that far. Mm -hmm. But it is amazing that you could have a magnitude seven or higher earthquake essentially have so much power that it could push the ground here a third, half the way around the world by the width of a postage oh, yeah. stamp of motion. My goodness. Now, and, there's, there's uh, another feature to this as well, correct? That, so we see this, but is there something also we can click and see the distance? Yeah, so I have the next one here. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you click on that, and this is, is a very this? nice tool from uh, is that uh, this the still? IRIS, the Incorporated Research Institute. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, this is the actual online. Yeah, so that's the online one. If you mm -hmm. go to my, well, actually, if you do the actual online, then you have to go to the date. Uh, I think, is that the seventh? Yeah. Oh, okay. This I is think the if seventh. you click on the green area to the right, Over it'll here? open up. Yeah, and there should have been on that one. Okay, there it does. So click on oh, the okay. little. So oh. for, for This is the U.S. Geological Survey. They kind of itemize a few of them, and if you click on them with your students, you can actually get the P wave and the oh. S wave, and this is a oh, and it labels recorded. where they are for that. Yeah, and they label them for you, You're right? And, and so, could I, if I was in the classroom, could I pull this up 
uh, from Lafayette and then pull it up from somewhere another oh, south absolutely. of that? absolutely, yeah. And so I can so, look yeah, at, this compare tool these is very throughout nice. the world? Again, you've got the link to that. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll put nice, that in the it's notes. It's called a station monitor link. And, and what's this do down here? Station, uh, the bottom. That, the bottom, well, before you do that, what they have is that they first of all tell you what the magnitude is, they tell you what the event time is, oh. and this is always a little tricky, and it gives it in what's called universal time, mm -hmm. yes. and that's sort of like uh, England time They'll without going on daylight time. saving time. So it's, <laughs> okay. you know, four, we're Eastern time, so four or five hours from here, depending on whether it's daylight saving, summer or winter, mm -hmm. you know, and, but it never, UTC time never changes. It's always the same, oh, okay. all the way around the world. And in fact, the U.S. was, was instrumental on that, because once we built the Transcontinental Railway, they had to have a uniform time throughout the whole country. And they used time zones, and they had a base time that the one-hour time zones are based on. But what they did is they instigated the whole world to have a time zone system, and the universal time is that. But uh, but if you look on the bottom of the, no, the, the very bottom, there, yeah, where I guess I'm jump up back over, here. yeah. So you see the epicenter, and that's the location on that little thing. Oh. Uh, that's where the event okay. happened in Puerto Rico. And again, even though that was only a 6.4, it happened just on the southern part of the island. And as a consequence, uh, uh, and a lot of aftershocks after, there was a 5.9, which is quite unusual, because cool. usually the biggest aftershock aren't as big as the main shock. Right. And, and 5.9 is smaller than a 6.4. But if a building was damaged by that earthquake, oh. it could be further damaged by aftershocks after that. So many people went out, and, and the electricity was knocked off. The, they were locked off the grid, oh. and and uh, yeah. So just after you know they had had hurricane uh, catastrophe, now they're having this earthquake catastrophe oh. as well. Here at Purdue, right. I just had someone call me uh, a few days ago about taking a field trip for Purdue over spring break to Puerto Rico. And they were concerned because the travel agents, people say, oh, it's going to be fine in two months. It's going to be fine. <laughs> so I didn't know. As I said, well, it's up to your students and their parents what they, what they, they decide to do uh -huh. at that point. But, but on that graph, the S is what's for the station. And that's okay. us, okay. Yeah, essentially, in West Lafayette. So if we pulled up a different station, it'd be it'd like be, an S yeah, over here. We'd be a C. That as okay. Well, right. And then you roughly get the distance. Now, that you could play back in audio just the same way as we did earlier. So if you click on that, it will play the earthquake above in, in sound. Okay. That's a little so quieter. It's a the little other. muted here. And, and again, I think you'd have to play with the volume a little bit. Yeah. I think they set the volume a little too low on this. Wow. This would be the loudness here. So mm -hmm. uh, um, you'd have to sort of play around with that tool. Okay. But but I, the origin I, time I, is very interesting yeah. because because Oh, there we go. Oh, that's wow. good. Yeah, so the origin time is not the time that the waves arrive here. It's when the actual earthquake fault rupture. Oh, and you, unless you are, okay. have people nearby or sensors nearby, that needs to be sort of found uh, uh, indirectly because you could have earthquakes all over the world that there aren't any sensors nearby, but they still have an origin time. They have the time that it happened. Mm -hmm. And that's something that a seismologist would like to determine in addition to their epicenter, which is their coordinates of where the earthquake happened. Now, most earthquakes don't happen on the surface, and they also have a depth that they occur, and that's the hypocenter. So, so in a typical kind of seismogenic zone for kind of crustal earthquakes, mm -hmm. it's about 10 kilometers beneath the surface. Oh. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, and they often don't rupture the surface. Many earthquakes do, but, but uh, most do not. Okay. So then the seismologist has to take those vibrations at their own stations and uh, triangulate in, and this would be an exercise you know, that, uh, that uh, the teachers with their students could do, is they could take several recordings, say, from an earthquake mm -hmm. and, and use that with tools you know, in, their, in oh. their study guide and stuff to triangulate in uh, where the earthquake occurred. Oh, very yeah. nice. So it's... Uh, uh, there's too much. I mean, there's too much good science that we're, we're going yeah. through. But I don't want to run totally out of time before we. Oh talk yeah, about, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, one of the things I was so excited to hear about when you start telling us are other things that you're listening in the ground for. Right. Well, let's go through a couple of more here, and then the first one. So these are seismic waves are still for any kind of sources, but if you're more local, you could have 
different kinds of cultural noise and others. And normally this is viewed, if you're trying to study these distant earthquakes, mm -hmm. as bad because they might cover up these things. But nowadays people are trying to use this local cultural noise to, 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 to see inside the earth as well, because they're sources of seismic energy as well. And okay. so we have an experiment west of West Lafayette of a number of stations. Near this station, uh, Scholar Farms. Okay. And the idea is to see how local vibrations go from different kinds of sources in the earth. And but before yeah, so if we go yeah, it's go up to the next slide above. Above it? Yeah, maybe this one. So this is our stations and this is about oh. thirty kilometers and that then that little blue dot Puff to us. the far right for people that don't know the geography area yeah, so is us here at Purdue University at West it, Lafayette. Mm -hmm. And it's a little above there because it's in the residential area of town. But we use that sensor to record in our display cabinet. And, and then if you go to the left, the one we've been looking at at Scholar Farms is the far bottom station. The way down here? That's Scholar Farms. Okay. And there's the Wabash River. And we have now for a year, we put up a number of other sensors around our, our two base stations in order to see how seismic vibrations travel. And so you can see like the trains you mentioned, you right. can even see like when they have construction zones in places, right? Well, the waves kind of damp out depending on their, their pitch. Okay. So the higher the frequency, they don't travel as far. But, but that's why we have this array. Now, if you look at the array there, it's, it's roughly about 30 kilometers and it goes up to Interstate 65 on US 231. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, for those that are, know the geography of our area, uh, uh, about halfway up there is the boundary between Tippecanoe County and White County. Mm -hmm. And White and Benton County, about 15 years ago now, yeah. uh, put up a huge wind turbine farm. And of a, over a thousand, I think a thousand sixty, but now they're going to be increasing them. Mm -hmm. And there have been, and this is for energy and for using it for, for kind of classical, you know, wind wind mm -hmm. you know wind turbines for for uh, generation of electricity and some people have kind of been concerned about uh, uh, whether that could give people headaches or could give problems I personally in the audio range uh, outside of the creaking of the blades of these uh, but I'm more interested in what the seismic waves are generated by the wind turbine and so I think we have a uh, well let me see if we go down here a little bit I think uh, the next one voice? down this is one of our our so-called portable stations, okay. and in about a week or two, I'm going to have, go have to go out there and retrieve discs from that little box from our so 16, box our 16 stations. in the ground, right? And, and there's, a, there's the solar a battery, panel, and, battery. Then, and then there's the the solar panel, and the solar panel will, uh, as long as the sun is out, will replenish the battery. Okay. And, mm -hmm. But after about a week, if we were unfortunate enough to have a week of cloudy thing, I could have my batteries be depleted here. Okay. And then a nice thing about having these only be, you know, five miles west of town is I can just simply drive over there in the morning sure. and if I had to change a battery. But but we have these kind of very these marine batteries that are basically hundred amp hour batteries mm -hmm. and they're yeah and, and uh, they can go for several days without the, the solar panel. And then the little black dot on top of the solar panel there is is uh, is the, the GPS. Oh. So it's measuring the it's doing a clock, a time clock. And that's putting that on there too. So seismology needs precise timing. And 25 or 30 years ago, with the advent of the, the GPS satellites, that was also one of these worldwide, global time zones like Universal Time. And and this thing is tracking the the the, the time and putting a timestamp on the the sensor vibrations that are recording in the little box. Now the seismometer itself is actually buried in the ground because we want it to be nicely coupled mm -hmm. in the ground. And how it's deep actually, is it? Uh, here it just depended how my student assistants, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> when they got tired. Yeah. So it's, it's about, it, they're about, uh, the seismometer itself is maybe a foot and a half across. And then there's some wiring that has to be sort of buried in the ground okay. so it doesn't vibrate with the wind. Uh, but we have it down maybe uh, close to a, a yard down okay. Okay. so it's like and I fortunately have a couple of it is amazing though that the ones that tend to deep dig the best holes may not be the biggest person <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, so and, and, uh, and again in about a week or two I'm gonna have to go back on these 16 stations and, and get out and replace the little diskettes in there and I'm just hoping that our winter 
continues as yeah, mild, mild as it is, right. and 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 also even with snow, because I'd have to if there was a big snow, I'd have to wipe off the solar panel and go out to each oh, of the stations. Sure. And 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 the homeowners here have been very very nice, and I really enjoy. I was saying that's going something out. you've you've talked to like landowners and stuff. Right. You have these on private property. We have some Mostly. on Purdue property on some of the agricultural farms, but most of them are on private property. Mm -hmm. And it's always entertaining going and, and talking to these people. And, and are you willing to put something with Purdue? And of course, you know, we have to kind of sign an agreement that we'll take it out and yeah. know, fill up everything when we're done. And, but these sensors out for one year. They went out in July of 2019 and will come out in. And this was largely because we want to get a number of, of earthquake signals mm -hmm. and roughly a magnitude six happens somewhere in the world every day but you have to sometimes have them close enough to get a nice recording of them mm -hmm. magnitude sevens they happen maybe once or twice a year and a magnitude eight or higher roughly once a year okay uh, but it, it doesn't happen like clockwork so in other words a magnitude like nine could happen well that's once in a decade maybe mm -hmm. but then you could get two in a decade, and then have a period where they don't. But on average, you'd have that roughly amount. So I'm trying to get that where I want these earthquake waves coming up at these stations, and I want them to kind of interact with the ground underneath these sensors so I can kind of see under the ground. Mm -hmm. So that's oh. the kind of notional aspect. You can yeah. look at it to study the, the sources, and we are, but we're also trying to use these to, to, to see inside the ground. I think we have a next picture here really quick. Yeah, well, time is, maybe uh, one more here real fast. Only one more? Oh, this, this yeah, is a wind turbine. This is, this is where we're, this is part of, we have one sensor over here, and we're trying to essentially measure the vibrations from the wind turbine. But again, so you're we're listening to, to, we're listening in to the, the ground, the listening yeah. to the wind. And here, if you look in the background, there are like, 30 of them, 30 of them, <laughs> near, so <laughs> nearby, but the whole wind turbine. And if, if you ever have the opportunity to go to, to, to uh, Fowler, uh, mm -hmm. that's kind of the center of Benton County, and, and they have nice brochure they can give out. Yeah. And they're literally all over the city of Fowler. And those were only within the last 15 years. Okay. So, so it's sort of like, and, and many of the teachers may be in parts of the world where they also have wind farms being put up. And again, right. it's for energy generation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and have you, so, have you seen any seismic activity yet from it? Or is that, will you uh, get yes. that data? Yes, and they have a kind of very unique one because it's sort of like propeller noise. So the, the rotors are going oh, across okay. and they have very certain pitches that those things generate, wow. okay. which is kind of cool. But when they lock them down, then you get an abrupt punch into the ground because that's basically, so if, there, if a strong weather happens, yeah. they have to go remotely or go kind of literally climb up to the top and, and, uh, and turn them off, hmm. you know, or, or flutter the blade or something like that. So when they do that and they do it too abruptly, you'll get like a, a kind of a punch wow. into the ground that gets measured. And those are the ones actually that they are concerned about for kind of the vitality of the wind turbine itself mm -hmm. and the near structures to it. So this is pretty exciting. We have really, if we start moving into energy, this is an interesting uh, component nowadays for alternative energy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but there are sort of the vibrational elements of this and, uh, and, uh, and measuring those nearby these wind turbines and, uh, and quantifying that. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, and so it's fairly exciting with the array we have out. Uh, we did have one, and I don't know, we should just stop on this. Oh, yeah, we're, say, we're, out of we're out of time. Yeah. Thank yeah. you yeah. so yeah. much. Yeah. For we're going to have to start another much. one. Yeah. We're going to have to do another one to do the yeah. rest of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Was so, I put too much together here, here, but it was, I very much appreciate it. And for the teachers out there, I think there's lots of exciting things for your, 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 your study plans that you can yes. do. And definitely look online for, for really interesting material that's available to you for your students. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Take part. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. An outstanding review. <laughs> On iTunes or your preferred Tweet podcast. us your science questions. At Purdue SOS. Until next time, be super and remember. You are someone's hero. Boop. And we're down. <laughs>